Hi, so it is afternoon, so good afternoon. Uh, yeah, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about Ruth Rubin, uh, her uh, materials that are housed here at YIVO, and uh, a little bit about what people are doing with these, with these materials. Uh, I uh, found out that Ruth Rubin originally uh, donated uh, the initial chunk of her uh, archive to YIVO uh, in 1977 and continued uh, up until the 90s to continue to place materials here. Um, she started uh, recording uh, folk singers in about 1946. Uh, and if you know anything about 1946, what, what would, would you have recorded on? Uh, uh, as sound archivists, a lot of the technical information uh, about, about these materials is, is interesting to me because for one thing, I have to figure out how to play them and uh, how to make them sound good. Uh, lucky for us, uh, Ruth Rubin uh, used uh, methods of recording that are actually at, for her time, uh, state of the art. So uh, in 1946, we have uh, we have these these original albums of of uh, her uh, field recordings that she started recording on a a disc recorder a single uh, disc recorder that recorded on uh, acetate discs and uh, they look like this um, so uh, usually you can see that this one has two songs on this side uh, and this one has one two three four uh, songs on on the flip side here and um, she was very meticulous about writing where these uh, uh, informants were recorded. You can see here where they were recorded and, uh, and who was singing. Uh, and uh, the recordings themselves tell us a lot about, about the people she recorded. Uh, all in all, oh, that's Ruth Rubin right there, by the way. She's uh, keeping us company there. And uh, she, uh, all in all, recorded somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 songs. Uh, that are in our our collection, um, and I'm going to do a combination of playing you some of her recordings uh, and and uh, also uh, singing a couple things uh, live that that I know. Uh, so let's start by hearing uh, uh, one of the singers that 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 she recorded named uh, Harry Ari. Uh, for those of you who, who have heard uh, any of her field recordings, this is one of uh, her uh, more remarkable and best love informants. Uh, he was uh, lived in Montreal. Uh, this uh, recording was made in uh, 1955, um, and Ruth was was actually um, a self a self style collector. So she kind of there wasn't anyone doing quite what she was doing when she did it. So she made up her kind of own own way. She discovered what recording equipment was good, and if you knew her, she was very short. She was tiny. And so if you can imagine her carrying one of these big recording machines, you know, uh, upstairs or, or, uh, or to someone's apartment or uh, to a folk song uh, collect collecting uh, session, uh, she, she didn't walk up to people on the street and say, you know, sing me something, but if she had the equipment that we have today, she probably would. Uh, so uh, here's, uh, here's Harry Ari singing um, a beautiful uh, ballad. Oi still in Ruik is often bass oilem. In the old world, uh, sometimes the only place uh, two people who were in love could meet was after dark uh, in the cemetery. Uh, so this is a song that, that uh, documents uh, that experience. Oh, you're still on the road. Is I from base island? Who can grasp that there is a need? Who can grasp that there is a need? As I sell schlaf, schlaf dein dem Eulen, und von unserer Liebe weiß doch keiner nicht. Du hast gewusst, 
da du kannst kein Liebe wehren. Du warst, als du mir so jung meine Kopf verdreht. Euer gleiche wollt ich ein Kind gestorben. Ey, der ich hab dir mehr da da kennt. Von Tag zu Tag brennt der Feier Gräse. Wenn ich seh dich nicht da zweiten gehen, euch stechen will ich sich nicht da messen. Also meine Augen sollen das nicht sehen. Stell sich nicht, du Schenju, euch mit kein Messer, weil deine Tränen seine nun siehst. Ihr bin schon mit Masel ach Hossen geworden. Du kannst schenken, wenn du willst. So, uh, as what can you say? Uh, it's really, really beautiful. Uh, one of one of the things that that has uh, renewed interest in Ruth Rubin's work uh, is the publication of of this book. Uh, which uh, was uh, uh, edited by uh, Mark Slobin and Hanem Lotik and came out in uh, uh, 2007. And so people have been uh, become interested in, uh, in the material that's in this book. Uh, and so I've been going around teaching uh, songs from this publication uh, for the last uh, few years. In fact, I'm close, uh, finishing up a session, a uh, series of classes uh, here uh, tomorrow night. Um, if anyone wants to catch the last one, uh, uh, so uh, another thing that, that happened because of the publication of this book was that, that uh, among the people who were interested uh, in seeing these recordings be made available uh, were uh, um, Ethel Rehm and Pete Ruszewski from the uh, Center for, for Traditional Music and Dance in New York, and they helped us um, uh, bring bring a woman, uh, Jeanette Levitsky from San Francisco, who is also interested in this material, uh, uh, a couple of summers ago, and uh, she came and she helped us create a database of these materials and um, helped us uh, start digitizing uh, these songs uh, that uh, are connected with this database. So, so far we've uh, digitized about 350 of the songs and of the 1,500 or so songs, she's uh, cataloged about uh, 1,000 uh, uh, pieces so far. Um, I'll show you another. Uh, this is uh, Ruth Rubin's uh, notebook that lists what's on uh, uh, the compilations of her uh, her tapes. So uh, in in the 50s, uh, when when uh, the the recording technology changed, uh, Ruth Rubin changed along with it, and she moved to recording tape. So this is one of her original uh, tapes. You can see here. There's um, with uh, with uh, all with, with with editing leader, and again with the. Information. One thing that's um, that's been nice about having Jeanette work on the collection is that uh, she uh, is conversant with the language and also with the musical style. So she's been uh, comparing different uh, sources. Um, there are several places where this collection, where um, copies of this collection are housed. Uh, one being uh, the uh, New York Public Library and uh, consulting three different lists of, of, of these recordings. She's compiled the notes from all of them and those are all in, in our database. Um, so I'd like to play for you uh, another song. Uh, one that's a bit, a bit humorous. Uh, this is, uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, one of the most remarkable things about Ruth Rubin's collection was that she had a, a, a friendship uh, with, with Schmerke Kaczerginski, uh, the great uh, partisan of Vilna, and uh, she uh, recorded uh, 
a, a large uh, group of, of songs uh, featuring his uh, singing of his repertoire, most, mostly things that he didn't, he didn't write. Uh, uh, and so it's interesting to hear, hear what his uh, repertoire was. Here, um, here we have him recorded in 1948, uh, humorous song, uh, Kumich zu mein geliebter Freud. And uh, Ruth Rubin, in, in the book, she, she, uh, she talks about uh, how a lot of uh, these songs have antecedents in other uh, song, uh, traditional song repertoires. Uh, this particular song um, can be found in the, uh, the, both the, the Irish and the English and the American uh, song repertoires. It's the, one of the songs of uh, genre of the unfaithful wife. Uh, and uh, in this Yiddish version, uh, the husband comes home and he sees that there are some boots uh, in the in the kitchen. And she sa he says, uh, "What are the boots doing there?" And she says, "Oh, those are nothing but slippers that my my um, mother sent to me." And he he says, "Well, I I never saw slippers with with high tops before." And uh, what do you need me for? So then uh, he goes, uh, next night he comes back and he sees and there's uh, three swords hanging on the wall. And he says, so what's with the, with the swords hanging on the wall? And she says, well, those are hot messes um, that my mother sent me. Uh, and he says, uh, well, hot messes usually don't have long tassels hanging from them. What's that about? Uh, the third verse, uh, he comes home and he sees uh, three heads in the bed. And he says, so what, what are they doing there? And, and, and she says, uh, well, uh, that's, uh, those, are, those are three children my mother sent to me. And he says, uh, children don't usually have black mustaches. <laughs> so here's Schmirke Kaczerginski. Komm mir zu mein geliebte Feuge, fin mir eins und zwei. In Kirch stehen Stivo, eins, zwei, drei. Frag ich bei mein geliebte Feu, was fragt die wohl seinen See? Entfert sie mir Steckschirchlach, die Mama schickt mir See. Steckschirchlach mit heiche Cholefkes, oi wei, das Herz tut mir weh. Als ich bin dein Mann, zu was badarst du See? Komm ich zu mein geliebte Feuge, fin ich eins und zwei. Auf dem Wand hängen Schwerden, eins, zwei, drei. Frag ich bei mein geliebte Feu, was frasch werden seine See. Entfert sie mir Hackmessers, die Mama schickt mir See. Hackmessers mit lange Fremdsalach, oi wei. Das Herz tut mir weh, als ich bin dein Mann, zu was badarst du sei. Komm ich zu mein geliebter Freude, finde ich eins und zwei. In Bett liegen Keppelach, eins, zwei, drei. Vergier bei mein geliebter Freude, was war Keppelach seinen See. Entfert sie mir Kinderlach, die Mama schickt mir sei. Kinderlach mit schwarzer Wunzerlach, oi wei, das Herz tut mir weh, als ich bin dein Mann, zu was darfst du sei. Ja, so, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think any of the other uh, versions have, uh, have uh, the three heads in the bed. I think that's a particularly Yiddish uh, thing. Uh, so, uh, so I, I didn't want to let this pass without playing a, a recording of Ruth Rubin herself singing. Um, as you probably know, she made a handful of commercial recordings, uh, uh, at least one of which was probably on that list uh, that, that Hannah wrote up. Here's a, a recording of Ruth Rubin uh, from, the, from the 50s. Um, but I think, uh, having listened to a lot of her singing, I think that she was certainly most comfortable singing unaccompanied. Uh, so here's a, I won't play the whole thing, it's a, it's a ballad that, that, uh, that she learned from her, her mother, who was a, a traditional singer. Dein um, es Raid, it's a, a dialogue between a father and a son uh, talking about uh, uh, aspects of, of, of being, being uh, holy and... Uh, Devout and what that means in the past, what that meant in the past, and what it means in the present. Mm -hmm. 
Dit is hartstikke geen Kodeljanski. Als ik ze me geblieben ben, zei ik van haar plaat. En ik heb het terwijl niet uitgezocht, nog een zieke schoenen goed om haar te schikken. Ik heb getracht, heb ze reuzen en een lied verreigd. Dus ik heb het liedje verzegd en alles ding met de geschichte en alles. Dat is een lied, wat ik heb gegeven. Mijn moeder had me reuzen en wat ik heb später gevonden als een verfasster tekst. Uh, auch gedruckt in 1989 von Dovet Apteker in Czernowitz. Die Melodie, versteht ihr, ist, ist in Ergis nicht da gedruckt und erfahrt es als eine teure Sache, was ich hier äh, besitzt. Äh, der Text ist also interessant und in der Mama hat es nicht ganz sehr geändert. Sie gedenkt es noch als Kind von ihrem Vetter von Brötchen. Nun, lass mich es so singen für euch, wenn mir sonst das Wetter gefallen, ihr könnt mir später schreiben wegen dem. Ihr singt das Punkt, wie die Mama hat es gesungen. Dann fuhrt er es reit, er zieh mein Kind, ich mein doch ganz gewiss dein Glück. Die hast doch schon, als so viel sind, auf jeden Schritt in eugen Blick. Het ist schon schieben, wär schön frimm, fast sucht die Lehm, wie mir gefällt. Wer dann ist schon mit ihm rein vor ihm, vor Gott in Himmel auf jener Welt. Lieber Futter, versteine dann sie hin, zu der Schiebe, wo es aus macht sie gerät. Vor wo soll ich schon eine Schiebe ziehen, wenn ich viel in sich noch gut kann ich hätte. Noch wenig lebt hinter der Sinn, noch nicht geräubt jenems Geld. Heißt die mir schon eine Schiebe ziehen, in Schad kommt mir schon in jene Welt. Wo es rettet sie, mein lieber Siehen, die Jasmine. Uh, I've, uh, we were talking about um, sort of using these materials, so uh, I have, have used a lot of, of the songs in Ruth Rubin's collection, uh, both actual uh, sound elements of, uh, of materials that she recorded and also um, songs that she collected. Uh, so I'll share with you a couple of those. Uh, these two uh, I used in a project that I did called uh, Saints and Sadiqs, uh, which was a, a collection of, of Yiddish and Irish songs that I uh, recorded and performed together with a, a wonderful singer called Susan McKeown. Uh, this is a song that uh, has its origins in a Ukrainian uh, ballad from World War I. Uh, talks about, uh, I looked over uh, fields and forests and I came across a dead soldier. Uh, he was running from the enemy with his brothers, but he wasn't lucky. The brothers escaped, but he uh, got shot. Uh, who will say Kaddish for me? Uh, who will make sure that my light doesn't go out? Uh, the only one who will come to my funeral will be my trusty uh, horse. Um, blackbird, come and fly and uh, sit a while on my grave and go and tell my mother that I'm well. <laughs> Da gehaget es elner euch weh. Dort liegt da gehaget es elner euch weh. Drei Brüder sind in Land laufen euch weh. Drei Brüder sind in Land laufen nun einem hat nebelt die Keul getroffen euch weh. Und in einem hat Nebuch die Keul getroffen, neu weh. Wer wird noch mir Kaddisch sagen, neu weh? Oi, wer wird noch mir Kaddisch sagen? Wer wird mein Licht noch tragen, neu weh? Wer wird mein Licht noch tragen, neu weh? Wer wird noch gehen, noch meine Weihe, oi weh? 
Oi, wer wird noch gehen, noch mein Leweie? Oi, das Viertel, das Getreie, oi, wei. Oi, das Viertel, das Getreie, oi, wei. Schwarze Vogel kum zu fliehen, oi, wei. Schwarze Vogel kum zu fliehen, setz sich auf mein Käverien, oi, wei. Set sich auf mein Käverien, oi wei. Schwarze Vögel fliege schwind, oi wei. Schwarze Vögel fliege schwind und sorg mein Mann, ich bin gesinnt, oi wei. Und sorg mein Mann, ich bin gesinnt, oi wei. Thank you. I, I just wanted to show you one other one other artifact. Uh, we just we don't just have Ruth Rubin's uh, recordings. We have her writings. We have her book collection. We have her uh, collection of commercial records that she had in her apartment. Uh, all sorts of things. And among those are um, her collection of. Um, uh, these are her, her lecture books that she used to use. If you ever saw her perform, she would always have one of these books and she'd be uh, reading out of these and, and using these as a, a, a prompt. So here's, a, here's one, of, one of these. Um, so I'd like to finish with, with uh, uh, one, more, one more song. This is a, a wedding song uh, that uh, I learned from, from one of her recordings and Ruth would love it, uh, would love anything more than hearing you all sing along with me. So uh, it has a chorus, it's very easy to sing. Uh, this is uh, one of those um, counting songs where it gets longer and longer and longer each verse. Um, and it says, uh, what is one? One is uh, the, t the, the, the table where the groom is, is hanging and singing with all his friends. Two is for the bride and groom, who are the most important thing of the wedding, of course. Three is for uh, the mechatonim, who are paying for everything. Four is for... Uh, the four, the, the chuppe the, the sticks that hold up the, the chuppe. Uh, five is for the klezmorim, who play for rich and poor. Uh, six is for the six days of the week, other than Shabbos, and the things that we may or may not have accomplished during those days. And seven is for uh, the traditional sheva brochas, the uh, seven blessings of the wedding, which promise us a dowry, but which give us kadoches. Ich will euch geben zu der Kleren, was von eins kennt als werden. Eins ist dem Chossens Tisch, wo man esst und wo man trinkt. Heu, wo man holt und man singt. Jullala, 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 jullala. Ich will euch geben zu der Kleren, was von zwei kennt als werden. Zwei in die Chossen Kalle, wo sie stehen, über alle. Eins ist dem Chossens Tisch, heu wo man esst und wo man trinkt, heu wo man holt und man singt. Jullala, 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 jullala. Ich will euch geben, zu der Kleren, was von drei kann als werden. Drei sind in die Mechut Tonim, wo sie zählen, die Melsemon im Zwesen, in die Chossen Kalle, wo sie stehen, über alle Eins ist dem Chossens Tisch, hei wo man esst und wo man trinkt, hei wo man hört und man singt, Jullala, 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 ich will euch geben, zu der Kleren, was von vier, Ihr kennt es werden, vier sind in die Hoppe stangen, Hossen Kalle, ja, vier gegangen, drei sind in die Mechutonim, wo sie zählen, die Mesumonim, zwei 
Wiesen in die Kassen kalle, wo sie stehen über alle. Eins ist dem Kassenstisch, hei wo man esst und wo man trinkt, hei wo man hört und man singt. Jullala, 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 jullala. Ich will euch geben, zu der Kleiden, was von Finnef kann als werden. Finnef sind in die Kles Morim, wo sie spielen, verreich und Orim. Vier sind in die Kuppe stangen, Hossen Kalle auf vier gegangen. Drei sind in die Mechutonim, wo sie zählen, die Mesmonim. Zwei sind in die Hossen Kalle, wo sie stehen, über alle. Eins ist dem Hossenstisch, heu wo man esst und wo man trinkt, heu wo man ho. Oh, yet on men sing to you la la, you la la la, you la la, you la la, you la la, you la la la, you la la, you la. Ich will euch geben, zu der Kleiden, was von sechs, ich kann als werden, sechs sein in die sechs Tage, was mit Tornitten, was mit Meg. Fünf sind in die Kles Morim, wo sie spielen, verreich und Orim. Vier sind in die Kuppe stangen, ich hoss in Kalle auf vier gegangen. Drei sind in die Mechutonim, wo sie zählen, die Mesumonim. Zwei sind in die Kles in Kalle, wo sie stehen, über alle. Eins ist dem Kles ins Tisch, heu wo man esst und wo man trinkt, heu wo man holiert und man singt. Jullala, jullala, jullala. You la la, 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 you la. Ich will euch geben, zu der Kleiden, was von sieben kann als werden. Sieben sind in die Schäfe broches, mehr Sotzen laden, mehr geht kadoches. Sechs sind in die sechs Teig, was mit Tornet und was mit Meg. Fünf sind in die Kles Morim, wo sie spielen, verreich und Orim. Vier sind in die Kuppe stangen, Hoss und Kalle auf vier gegangen. Drei sind in die Mechutonim, wo sie zählen, die Mesmonim. Zwei sind in die Hoss und Kalle, wo sie stehen, über alle. Eins ist dem Hoss ins Tisch, heu wo man esst und wo man trinkt, heu wo man hört. Jetzt und man singt, jo la. Yulala, 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 yulala. No chamo yulala, 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 yulala. Chaim. Thank you very much. What a great example of taking stuff from the archive and bringing it out into the world. Uh, we have to assemble our panel fairly quickly, so could we get everybody up here who's going to be on the panel? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> people talk a little bit about their work in the uh, archives um, and uh, uh, sure uh, unfortunately wait we have to get these mics on is somebody turning on the mics they're on? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, Ethel Rehm couldn't be with us. She's really ill today. She tried to get here, but okay. she couldn't. Um, but uh, we have uh, some wonderful people, and I think we'll start with Mark Kligman, because he's the one who has to leave early for another place he's doing. Um, Mark Kligman, who is, of course, distinguished uh, musicologist, ethnomusicologist um, uh, at Hebrew Union College, uh, but who is also uh, very much engaged with the enormous uh, archives of the Birnbaum collection, the other collections that are at, uh, in Hebrew Union College of Jewish music, which he is bringing out to light, uh, doing, uh, so he, he's, among his other hats, he has the archive hat. Gila Fahm, you already know, and Lauren, you know. And this, of course, is the redoubtable Hank Esnetsky. Um, who is, uh, in addition to all the things he does as a producer, arranger, composer, uh, band leader, um, has his own private archive, which he's been assembling for a very long time, and uh, every week collects more 
uh, things uh, in his archive and also uh, things that are on the website of the uh, uh, Yiddish Book Center, including that amazing interview with Hannah Mwatek, which if you don't all know, you should go to the, that site. And wow, it's over an hour long, and it's uh, an extraordinary interview that uh, Hank has managed to get um, in the very late years uh, from Hana. So uh, I had asked, um, I had thought of some general questions. Um, uh, one of them is whether they could each come up with an example of how they took something from an archive and put it out into the uh, into the wider world. And uh, what is what does it mean to be an archival uh, activist? So uh, let me start with Mark. Sure. And I first need to apologize that I will need to leave a little quickly because. The uh, famous story of I have to dance at two weddings with uh, one tukha, so I have to leave very, very shortly. The, um, I think an interesting connection to Hannah Malotek in the story would be as follows. Um, I teach at Hebrew Union College, which is just a few blocks from here, and over the years I've had my students come uh, here to see the archives and work with Hannah, and largely our cantorial students see cantorial music and synagogue music as the primary form of Jewish music, and we try and open their doors open their worlds, open their ears to many different forms of music. And occasionally there's a student who's interested in Yiddish music. So there's a student who's interested in the connection between cantorial music and Yiddish music. And there was a particular article that a student read in the Journal of Jewish Music and Liturgy that sort of was very negative about the connection between music of the synagogue and Yiddish music. So this student brought that article to Hana, and Hana really was so upset to hear this article because she really thought that Yiddish music and, and uh, cantorial music were so closely connected. And then for years after, when I would see Hannah, she would argue with me about that one article. And I would tell her I didn't write that article, I just you know, <laughs> sent the students the article, but that's the opportunity to disagree and do work. So I'd like to speak briefly about two things. One is the Edward Birnbaum collection of Jewish music, and another is a collection here, the Charlie Bernhout. Collection. So the Edward Birnbaum collection is really considered to be the largest collection of Jewish music. Now, you've probably heard that three times already today, but the Edward Birnbaum collection encompasses material from 1770 to 1920. It was amassed by several different cantors, finally by Edward Birnbaum, who was a cantor in Konigsberg, from 1880 to 1920. And in 1922, it came into the possession, or was purchased by Hebrew Union College. Jewish Institute of Religion, who has it in their Cincinnati library. And the famous Jewish musicologist, A.Z. Idelson, based a great deal of his work in his famous book, Jewish Music and its Historical Development, his thesaurus of um, Hebrew and Oriental Melodies, um, on this collection. This collection really sort of defines the music of the 18th and 19th century. Idelson worked with this material. Eric Werner worked with this material. It's really a primary material for Jewish music, but it's been in Cincinnati. Very few people have actually um, used this particular um, uh, the, the, this collection. Uh, the big um, s uh, statement to make is that Israel Adler, who was in Jerusalem, wrote um, a major bibliography um, and did a lot of cataloging of the pre-1840 material in this particular collection. So this collection consists of over 1,200 different handwritten manuscripts of Jewish music. Um, there are, um, we, we just recently are involved in a project, recently required some money, where we've now digitized all the music in this collection, which is about 30,000 different images of music. Um, there are estimated to be an equal number or more amount of archival documents of synagogue records from the 18th and 19th century. And together, we're trying to put this uh, uh, on a website, and it's a project that will be ongoing for Hebrew Union College. And there's many, many more um, stories to tell out of these collections about individual cantors, about uh, different people in, in different ways. And I think that what we've uh, found so far in the material that we've collected is just fascinating materials that uh, we really didn't know that truly existed prior. And one example might be, probably for interest of this uh, audience here, is that in general, the Central European or the German tradition was documented first, and the Eastern European material was really documented later. So I recently found in a um, manuscript that actually comes from, um, um, hang on, it's gonna hit me in a second. Uh, um, it's not Konigsberg, it's, it, it's, it's sort of a city sort of between um, 
Eastern and Western Europe, where there was a manuscript of 30 different items that mostly had German material, but the famous cantor named the Kashtan, or Solomon Weintraub, um, has some of his cantorial melodies in this manuscript that really dates to somewhere between 1815 and 1820. So to have recordings of music from the Eastern European tradition that go back at least 200 years is fairly extraordinary. We have very, very little written record of music that's really that early. And most of this material is still really unknown. Most of the material that Idelson looked at at this age was really just preferencing the Central European tradition because Idelson and Werner felt that the German tradition was a more advanced, more developed tradition and looked at the Eastern European tradition in a very different way. The other collection to really talk about that is housed here as a part of the American Society for Jewish Music is the Charlie Bernhardt collection of Jewish music. And Charlie is still here. And uh, this is an amazing collection of uh, 15,000 different rec actual recordings. Most of it includes cantorial music, or that's the better part of this collection, but it really includes a very, very wide variety of Jewish music, including Yiddish, Yiddish theater, all sorts of different boys' choirs, all sorts of different songs, and we're working very actively now to digitize these recordings, but in addition to digitizing the actual sound of the recordings, we're actually digitizing all the material that comes with the recording. So all of the liner notes that are uh, on that recording, anything that's on the back record jacket is going to be available for someone to, to really look at. And this is done on a very detailed, almost unprecedented scale. And in some of the materials as an advisor to this project that I've seen is you just look at the albums, covers of these different albums from you know, the 1930s, 1940s, and then going on forward through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's such an interesting marker of the way that Jews want to be perceived somewhat artistically, somewhat literally, and seeing the music that's on there, seeing the range of Israeli influence that's involved um, in this music over time, seeing how Yiddish music, klezmer music, is involved in this entire history. We really come to a point now where we really have such a wide variety of music that's available to us. And I think that one of the greater challenges for those of us that are either performers or rangers or myself, a college professor of music, is really how to uh, share with students the incredible variety of this music and how to get them to actually get access to this music. And it's a very difficult thing. It, it, where Hebrew Union College is, is at Broadway and West Forth, and exactly diagonally from the building was Tower Records. And I did an assignment for many years when Tower Records was still open. As I tell the students, you know, before you come to class next week, I want you to find all the places in Tower Records where you can find Jewish music. And they would find it in world music. They find it in all sorts of different sort of places. But now I can't do that because there are really no record stores left anymore. And people are just finding the music on their own on the internet in different places. Now there are great opportunities here, but it's one in which when someone is looking for something, they're going to find it in a desperate um, set of ways, and it's something that we really need to give a great deal of thought to. In many ways, what we've seen today is how the Yiddish music is more advanced than a lot of the other, uh, other musical um, uh, categories that, that, we, that we really have in terms of its indexing, in terms of looking at the text, looking at the music, and actually find it in, in, in collections. We really don't have that in cantorial music. We have that in klezmer music in various different ways. But Yiddish music really has, is in many ways, is I, kind, I think the leader in some of this, but yet people have to find it each on their own. So I think this is going to be a real interesting challenge for us. Great, thanks. That's that's really a nice overview of materials that we don't necessarily hear about that are coming out now. And uh, you actually have students who do these performances, who, re, who recreate some of these old pieces in the 18th, 19th century. Um, and so students are an answer to how you make the link. Um, I've um, done this with the Ruth Rubin book. I've uh, had this class where I, I hand them the book after very little preparation of one session. I say, you're taking this book and you're finding a song and you're bringing in a, uh, your own arrangement of it next week. And I thought, this is not going to work. They're not going to like this stuff. They're not going to know what to do with this. It's this big, fat, expensive book. And they came back with the most wonderful things. Um, and they got very excited when they were handed this. Uh, so I, you know, just 
I didn't know they sang about labor songs. Like, this is amazing, you know. Or uh, that tune was so beautiful, I had to do a solo sax version of it that I'm bringing in to class because just the melody gets me. And I love it when people notice how beautiful the, the melodies themselves are. Uh, so the, that was a nice little project once we had that book that I was so lucky to be able to do with, with Hannah. Uh, Gil, how do you bring things out of the archive? And, uh, yeah, I wanted to say that uh, archives are very important, A, to know how uh, melodies transfer from culture to culture, from uh, format to format, from written format to oral format and back to written format. This is a very special uh, case in Jewish music. Some of the pieces were written before and never performed. Some were performed and never written down. And because we, we are lacking information because of the Holocaust, because of the immigration of the Jewish people, then uh, therefore it's very important for collaboration of all archives. Digitization really brought up out a lot of material, especially sound. It will be more difficult to digitize the um, manuscripts. And also when you digitize manuscripts or cantorial music, you first have to catalog it and you have to know how to catalog it. And that's one of the problems of Jewish music is what is the title of the piece? What is, and what we really need is um, some kind of a tool to recognize melodies. Like uh, you sing the melody and then it pops up in klezmer music and in Yiddish song and in cantorial music. And this I think is the future is to have an analytical tool of recognizing uh, tunes and then we see how really this entire Ashkenazic music is one. Because what we saw now is really like Yiddish song. And I'm sure there is an influence between Yiddish, klezmer, cantorial, right, uh, cantillation, Hasidic. Hasidic. And Hasidic is, uh, we have the richest collection of Yaakov Mazor of Hasidic uh, tunes. And this is the most difficult thing to catalog, but we don't talk about it now, so. Yeah, this is very important. Everybody chops things up into distinct repertoires, and folklore studies loves doing things like that, or, or something like Mayer Noise classification system. But you can see that the inspiration uh, flows out from the people into these different forms, into Cantorial, into Klezmer. It's all the same inspirational source. These people were living in the same communities. It's not like they were, oh, I can't use that tune. That tune is from here or there, or that's a tune from... They were um, really uh, very open to that. So we have to be open as well. Hankus, what do you do in well, bringing um, things up? I mean, uh, you, you asked about an example um, of using an archive and getting it out. Um, and, I mean, I... I have to say that I think the way that you get music out mostly is performing it, and that the better the performers, uh, the more the music gets out. I, we just did a 90th birthday concert with Theo Bikel. Uh, it was a great example of someone who has probably done more than anyone else to get Yiddish songs out and still is doing it, and pairing with, you know, we brought Dan Kahn from Berlin, and Josh Dolgan from Montreal, and Frank from here, and I mean, so um, that's really, I think, I think uh, the key is, is publishing and getting, you know, also getting recordings out. But for me, uh, I think the archive that made a difference for me actually was Gratz College in Philadelphia, um, because when I was trying to find out about klezmer music, the only archive I had was my family's uh, collection. And, um, you know, so, so uh, th th and there were a couple things about that that I think were really kind of remarkable. I mean, if you lived in Philadelphia, you knew that Gratz College had an archive. That was one thing. I mean, any, anyone who went to Hebrew school knew Shalom Altman. He was ubiquitous. He was an amazing um, musician. He was very much in the community. So it was an archivist who also was really out there leading children's choirs and kind of getting around. And that was, that was a very different thing in a way, very public uh, protege of Harry Cooper Smith. But when Harry Cooper Smith put his book out in 1950, The Songs We Sing, you know, he put out over 350 Jewish songs, two Yiddish songs in the entire book. Uh, when Altman put his book out, it was almost half Yiddish songs, actually. Um, so um, uh, when I went to research there, and it was also interesting who was using the archive, you know, because, I mean, I met, uh, for example, Nathaniel Enton also worked at Gratz College as the audiovisual guy, and he, he's the guy who put out the uh, Folkways record of Zunzer songs. Gira Feidman would come to Philadelphia just to do research in that, in that library also uh, to, to record 78s. So it was, it was known, and um, 
I, I think the thing that I want to say about it is just uh, finding the BELF recordings was very interesting. I mean, I, I would record everything that I could, and a lot of it was familiar. It sort of sounded like my uncle's collection and my grandfather's collection. But then there were this whole box of these things, and they sounded a little different. And I found more and more of them, and finally, you know, it became... Um, um, they, there were about, you know, about 30 or 35 of these weird looking, you know, records on some strange, with some strange Cyrillic alphabet. I had no idea what they were, but I recorded all of them, wrote down things as best I could, and um, put them on a cassette, which was what we did back then. Um, always made a copy of the cassette for Mr. Altman, that was important. And then did what we did, which was we traded these like baseball cards, you know. Um, send them around to, to your friends and say, has anyone heard these? And um, it was amazing because really um, in the klezmer world, that stuff went the 1981 equivalent of viral uh, very quickly um, and, and, and became um, really one of the standard repertoires of the, of the revival. And it was interesting because it was years before anyone found any more of those. Um, but it was just that they were sitting in this archive. Um, there's a sad ending to this, I think, because, I mean, um, the person who took uh, Altman's place, unfortunately, apparently has been selling off the collection that she kind of took home on eBay. Um, and uh, so this is another problem, <laughs> which is that, um, you know, you, you want to find an honest archivist um, who actually, um, you know, keeps, keeps the stuff in place and saves it for saves it for generations. And this has been a problem at other archives too, so I just want to bring that up also. Gratz has not sustained this, Gratz has never digitized it, but you know, um, at least it was there when we needed it. Thanks, thanks, that's, that's another great example. And how these archives can be so obscure but yet so influential is, is really very, very interesting. Uh, Lauren, want to throw something in? Uh, well, I, I can say that, that my own experience is that, is that in my work, um, as a as a performer, I for my own work, I, I can say that probably everything that I've done has drawn on the sound archives in some in some way, um, and you know, and and also been been a huge part and probably the most important part of my own education as a as a as a performer and and in my work as an archivist, it kind of was a circular thing because when I first started. Working for Yiva, which has now been a total of some like I think I'm in my 21st year, wow. and um, when I first started at Yiva, I wasn't I wasn't in the sound archives at all. I was a graphic designer and doing other stuff. So, um, so I I'm I'm a product of the Yivo Yivo archives, um, but but now I you know aside from my own my own work, which has included both finding material um, and being able to hear performance styles. And um, actually, like I said before, about sam using samples of materials in, you know, repurposing them for for new sound things uh, for for songs and such, um, is the ability to be able to share the material with other with other people. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm working with someone right now who's who's interested in cantorial in cantor in cantorial material, and and uh, she's you know listening to. To things that are that she hasn't heard before, and um, so you know, in it, I think it's important with 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 archival collections to have someone there who actually knows what what the, the material is. Um, I I I can't like stress that that enough and how important it is, and and you know that 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 people who run archives and libraries, you know, should hold on to those people who who know what. The stuff is, and how to explain it to people, and how yeah. to give them access to it. And I think that that's really important. And uh, there is no designated successor to Hana um, here that I know of. Um, so, yes, it can be a problem when the walking encyclopedia no longer walks um, amongst the halls. Um, you just remind me of one anecdote. Um, and even very obscure small archives can have this effect. Was, I remember I was in San Francisco in 1974, as it happened. I went to the Magnus Museum, this little Jewish museum there. And this guy was showing me around. And this was like 74. And he said, uh, 
you know, I've just discovered the most amazing thing. They have these old records here. I mean, I'd never heard of this stuff. You put this stuff on, like, oh, this is really amazing. And that was Lev Lieberman, who then went on to make what's usually called the first Klezmer album out of the Bay Area. So when you look at that album and you think, yeah, they were a bunch of hippies and Balkan music people, and, you know, they put out an album, but he actually started out of the archives, too, even though there was practically no archive to speak of in the Bay Area. Um, I, I remember that moment, and then, it, you know, kind of sank in me later that that was a kind of foundational for a particular branch of this whole enterprise. Um, if we have a few more minutes, there's one question that's a little out of left field, but um, intrigues me. When we heard a few songs we heard, we heard the voices of individuals, uh, but we characterize them as belonging to a whole community or being the voice of a whole community. Um, archives don't have voices of communities. Archives only have voices of individuals. And um, so where there's this funny slippage between this wonderful singer and the idea of that is the Yiddish song, which you get by piling up examples, I, I understand. But still, um, I wonder if you can talk a little about that, your work with individuals, and then out of that, you get a picture of a collective and the idea of a picture of a community. Uh, can I just start? Yeah. I, I have to run out. Um, well, I think... <laughs> what? Um, to me, what Mark is describing is what ethnomusicology is. And this is really the way that it works, even if you don't have archives, and you're working as an ethnomusicologist, and all the traditions that I've worked in is that you have a foot in the door, and your foot in the door is going to be an individual. And one of the most important things that I've learned um, in the research that I've done is you learn how fragile different traditions are because they're so dependent on people and different individuals. And even when things become institutionalized through a cantorial school or through a school of music or whatever it might be, it's still very fragile because there's this incredible oral tradition that really is highly connected to it. And I think that um, it all depends, I think, on kind of where the foot in the door is and who is the, who's the person that's, uh, that's really involved in it. And I think that the biggest challenge that we have today in Jewish music for students and for performers is that everyone is, you know, what, what's the Yiddish expression, you know, Shabbos zichalein, everyone's making Shabbos for themselves. Right? In Jewish music, everyone is coming to it in their own way. Now that may be a given, but we don't have like a center portal where people can come to to really then discover the different kinds of things, to really find the various aspects of things that are going on. But those that are involved in a particular subject who are massing these different things together, it is very difficult to, to start um, relating and preferencing and making all these different connections. But that really is the goal of of doing the scholarship and, and the work on this is making those connections. And maybe you know, it would be great if you could talk about um, your work with the uh, Welch Ghetto survivors, um, where it was a set of individuals, but you managed in your wonderful book um, and uh, to uh, convey the sense of how the whole community, uh, you know, the community sensitivity out of working with a fragmentary group of individuals you had access to. Uh, yeah, you can, you can sometimes, from your interviews, make sense of what was popular and what was not popular, uh, especially in Yiddish songs. You can make up the community from seeing many variants. If you see a lot of variants, then it means this song was around for a big community uh, from pre-war times. And I think there is a big difference between uh, liturgical music and paraliturgical music. It's easier to not as easy, but it's easier to see in liturgical music what was popular, what, which melodies were uh, sustained by the community, as in uh, folk song uh, and klezmer music and maybe uh, uh, Hasidic tunes as well, you see that there is a richness, that out of this richness only few melodies or few texts survive. But you can uh, figure out from interviews, and I think that's why it's important when you digitize or when you document, to document the whole thing, not just the melody and the lyrics, but the whole context, like I did with the Lodge Ghetto, and like we do in the archives, always the menu, you, you scan the, 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 the back cover and the, the list of the songs and the graphics, and if you interview a performer, that, that's what leads you. That's why our collection has the interviews. We never cut or edit only the songs. And if you work with the individuals, uh, you have to interview them about the context of singing, and then you might somehow have the picture of the community. 
uh -huh. uh, it needs some imagination and uh, research for the scholar, but without that we lose the whole point of doing ethnomusicology. Pankas, what about like your work in Philadelphia, where you? Well, yeah, I mean, I've done a few projects like this where it's really highlighting, um, you know, I, I have to say, I mean, when I learned klezmer music, I thought it was this kind of general thing that was all the same everywhere. And then I started actually doing research locally and found out it was completely different even in an American city. And that you actually really had, to, not only that, but each family had their own repertoire. And what the story was really that the family repertoires were coming to this place and becoming a, um, a local repertoire, but each person was bring, what each person was bringing was very significant. And in fact, it would some, it, you know, I also looked at how the influence of that person might be based on how good the musicians were. Um, well, that happens in every kind of music. Um, so, I mean, I think it's very important to keep in mind the, the, uh, the individuals who are, who are uh, giving their input. I like what Gila said very much also about um, context and in the Yiddish Book Center uh, oral history project, um, you know, like people know a lot of, you know, people hear a lot of music, say, from Ben Sion Schenker, but there's nothing except this tiny little Milk and Archive uh, interview with Ben Sion Schenker that's even possibly available. We did about a two hour interview with uh, Ben Sion Schenker to uh, give a context to his, to his music. Um, and we're continuing that. I mean, we're doing some more of those this spring. So um, I think the internet is a great uh, resource for that. Uh, and it's, it's really what archives need to move into the future. Yeah, I, it, this is <clears throat> particularly important because the tradition we're talking about um, is not like, I mean, when I went into ethnomusicology, it was like looking at Hungarian Academy of Sciences with their 100,000 tunes of the Hungarians. And they know every song everybody sang in every village over 100 years and saying, what do we have from the Yiddish tradition, these tiny crumbs from this banquet? The few people that sang for Ruth, the, you know, the few collections that were put out. So that individuals, for us, are super important, uh, way more than they are in, in a lot of these other European uh, folklore traditions where they have you know, vast, statistically meaningful collections. Because there's no way to understand what the Yiddish song world was anymore. Because we don't have anything remotely like a representative sample of anything. Um, so then we have to rely on... Yeah, I guess I, I, there was one other thing. I was sort of prepared more to talk about the recent project, which uh, since 1993 I've been documenting the repertoire of one individual um, and uh, have hundreds and hundreds of songs, and, and you know, cantorials, chazonis, uh, Hasidic songs, folk songs, uh, uh, theater songs um, of, of one person. And what I've been doing is going around um, and doing programs where, for example, on, uh, I just did a Shabbaton at a reconstructionist place in Montreal, but I just decided, okay, this Shabbos, this is going, we're going to be having Shabbos in a little farming village in Karpato, Ruthenia in 1935. And people were kind of shocked. But, but all the, what I did is I introduced the melodies for the prayers from this one person. And it really is amazing what happens when you associate And I gave a lot of biographical information, had photos. And they really got to know this one family. I think that this is one of the problems with Jewish education over the 20th century, the standardization, the idea, here's what it is, you know. And I mean, I've really... Uh, I really feel strongly that, it, you know, not only do we have to get this material out to educators, and that's a huge hurdle, by the way, that's probably the biggest hurdle, but also when we get the material out, it's got to be about individuals, it's got to be personal, it's got to have that, you know, it's a think, you know, think local, act global, as, as my congressman said once. <laughs> Tip O'Neill, okay. Uh, yeah, this is important. Well, we are, are over time. Um, Lauren, do you have one more comment from the Evo perspective? Uh, just, just to say that that I think that that one of the greatest things is is when people take these songs and or and they and they start taking them out in the world, and then you hear other people singing them, um, and you hear groups of people singing them, and you know, I mean, that's great. It's like it's what these things should be living you know, living, living, breathing parts of our culture and not on a page and not in a, in a digital form, but they should be actively, you know, um, you know, become part of people's lives. And, and I think that, that that's the greatest uh, thing of all and the greatest goal of all is to do that. 
And uh, nobody did that better than Hannah Malotic. So uh, thank you all for uh, coming and being agreeing to Okay, a couple okay. questions if, yeah, if people yeah. are staying. Okay, we you know what, I actually have a question for Hankus. Can you talk about the hurdle of, of uh, getting it out there to the Jewish edu educators? What's involved? What well, do you I, I met that? that. I was working at the book center, uh, the Yiddish book center for a few years, and I, the first thing I was told was develop a curriculum for Jewish day schools. And then I said to Aaron, okay, so who is asking for it, and are they going to use it? And he said, just develop it. I said, well, okay, but... Um, let me call a couple of Jewish day schools and find out if they're interested in this. And I, I, mean, I started doing this, and people were saying, no, we don't want that. We don't have anyone to teach that. We have no connection to that. That's not at all in our curriculum. So, I mean, right away, it's just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge hurdle. And, and I think the hurdle will be answered um, when... I mean, what I think is that the, the big disconnect, I mean, in my career, I, you know, we, well, you look, you see the Krakow Festival, you see 10,000 people out in the street celebrating Yiddish music, or, I mean, we play at the Hollywood Bowl with Perlman, there's 10,000 people out there. Somehow, maybe there are no Jewish educators in the audience, or no rabbis, or no cantors. I don't get it. Why don't they notice? There are tens of thousands of young people who are interested in, in, this, in this stuff, and yet they... It never occurs to anyone that, that they may want to drop the agenda they ad adopted in 1950 where everything is about Israel. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge hurdle. I think it'll happen, but, I mean, we just ha all have to keep pushing, that's all. Oh, I just wanted to add to this that Ruth's archive is in the Library of Congress and available to anybody who has the time. I actually... Xeroxed as much of it as I possibly could, but it is sitting there, and, uh, and she lives through it, and through people like me who adored her. Part of my question was already answered by you people. I figure archives is a phenomenal job, and it's a very important job, but that means that that material is buried until somebody comes and uses it. How many people know about it? That's what we're talking it? about here. <laughs> there are many, many forums out there, like Shalom TV in this area, or uh, let's say summer festivals in Israel, or in New York, or wherever, whatever. Just to bring people, f do it free. It's so important, passing the torch. Well, the most, the most obvious there. example of that would, of course, be what Hana did, which was to have Zalman. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. I mean, because yeah. you, you can't do it better than that to pass it on in the family and to the rest of the world. Yeah, and unfortunately, there is this general disconnect between the so-called American Jewish community and its culture. Uh, and uh, culture is just simply broadly considered not where people put their investment or their energy. And uh, we just saw the end of the National Foundation for Jewish Culture. Uh, and um, this, this is not what people tend to invest in. So uh, that's a little hard. It's a little hard to change the people who have the money and, uh, yeah. and who, who set the agenda for what the, the larger community uh, does, where it puts its attention in curriculum, uh, in, in program development, in staff positions. Um, there's not a whole lot archivists can do about that. But um, archivists can um, set an example. They can set an example, and um, that's what I think we've been hearing about. And I think you've all been exemplary, staying through. Uh, and I think we we should probably wrap, wrap up. Can we do two oh. more questions? Is well, that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, just as a side comment to Hankus's point, I mean, of course, Yivo did produce a very detailed, oh, yeah. wonderful high school curriculum on East European Jewish culture, and it's not clear, right, who who the audience for it actually is. Um, but my, my question as a former archivist and a professional historian and a non-musician but a lover of klezmer and Jewish music, something that I always think about is, um, you know, on the one hand, as, a, as I said, as a, as a historian, right, I would like people to be performing this music in a kind of quote-unquote authentic way, you know, to preserve the original style and traditions and to make it known, but then, of course, Artists come and they want to interpret and do something new with the music. And, you know, Gila presented one clip, I think, of that. And 
Lauren, of course, you've done wonderful, wonderful work with this throughout your career, you know, but something I always struggle with just as a lover of music is how you kind of balance that desire to preserve the material by getting it out in something close to its original form and giving artists license to do something creative and new with it that's still somehow true to the spirit. So I'd just be really interested to hear any of your thoughts on how you kind of make that balance, you know, not freezing it in time, but yet being true to, you know, to the heritage and the, right, and the, the original culture. I wanted to say something. I think authenticity is uh, a very hard word in music to define. And there is a wonderful example of the Songs of the Lodge Ghetto, which is being performed by Brave Old World and another uh, Klezmer group, Klezroim, in Germany and Poland for non-Jewish audience. And it has a completely different meaning and completely different sound. And for 20 years, I thought it's horrible. And now I, thought, I think it's wonderful. So it took me 20 years to get used to the new sound and realize that it symbolizes Jewish culture uh, and the Holocaust. And it's better for these tunes to be heard, even though it's completely non-authentic. Yeah, you have to let the, the, the thing is to just simply let people do what they're going to do. And uh, some of it will be great, some of it will be not very good, some of it will be terrible. But, that's, but that is in itself the tradition. That's what everybody has always done with the songs that they had when they grew up with, even when they were supposedly in a community. They got on a train and took it to some other marketplace. Uh, commercially to make a living, uh, or we wouldn't have the Brotherzinger even, you know, in the 1860s. Uh, that, that impulse to take stuff out and uh, do it in whichever way, um, and of course that was Hannah's wonderful article about how quickly a community, when it's a community, adopts stuff. Within six months of Shalom Aleichem producing Shlof Mein Kind, the song was all over the Russian Empire. And she, I mean, that was a, a, a wonderful piece of research she did to just to simply show how fast things moved in the supposed bogged down shtetl pale of settlement. People were moving around like crazy and, um, and were taking music and turning it into new kinds of uh, products all the time. So I don't think we should be afraid of any of that. Um, it, it's just a sign that there's some life there. Are we one more? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just a, a quick comment. Uh, we've heard a lot about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, all all morning today and this afternoon about Jew, uh, Yiddish folk music, klezmer, chazanut. I haven't heard a word about this enormous subject of Yiddish theater. So let's not forget about it. Well, we did mention what the vast archives are in the uh, here, the Perlmutter and the and the uh, Vilna archive, which are. Vast, vast archives that I worked in and was very grateful to have here. Um, and here's your prime example. Michael Oakes is putting out, for the first time in, in 80 years, a performing edition of um, Rumshinsky's wonderful operetta, The Golden Akala. This will be on May 27th. And uh, he took that out of the archives. Um, and he's going to make it come alive with real uh, audiences. Uh, not only that, it's in the... Um, it's in this an amazing national repository of 40 of the best, most important works of American music culture. The Golden Akala is one of those. Uh, and so then it creates another archival space for it within, the, within American music proper, which is really a, a, a terrific achievement. So it's not just always you know, limited to some little Jewish world who might want to come to hear something. Um, so, yeah, there's, a, of course, he is himself an archivist and librarian. Um, One last from... Oh, I Hank just want to also mention that, that Joel Berkowitz um, out there in Milwaukee um, has this working group of people who are interested in Yiddish theater, and just last week, uh, since Lauren and Miriam Chaya and I were out there doing music, we introduced the idea of including music in this digital uh, digital archive conference, and, and you should also be involved in that, as should, of course, Mark. Um, but we were telling them that also. So uh, hopefully uh, the Yiddish theater people will be, uh, will be empowering the music people very soon. I was just thinking of my friend Bob Friedman, who has the Yiddish collection at the University of Pennsylvania. He's been a friend of mine for over 30 years. And the problem of duplication of effort uh, I, I, I know each of us want to uh, sort of keep what we have, but it seems to me, is there any, it's, it's a crazy question, of course, is there any way to avoid this duplication of effort by uh, joining forces? Uh, um, this does not work very well in the world of scholarship and archives. You need a mega 
person at the top that everybody trusts to go around and work with their materials and say this duplicates that. It does not uh, suit the temperament of the archivist by and large, I would say. But yes, it would be very nice. But on the other hand, who cares? If there are four different versions from Ford Atlantic and Bob Friedman and Hankus and then in the Hebrew University of National Archives, I mean, who cares if that same song is there four times? It's fine because people are going to use different sources and they'll run into it everywhere they go. Um, it'd be a little hard to get a super uh, umbrella uh, thing over all of this, I would expect. Well, we, I think we do need to wrap up. Thank you so much, everybody. And...